So the last speaker for today's plenary session is Dr. Charles Manda. He is a principal partner at the patent practice of Smanda and Shellnut LLC. He has been a patent agent for over 12 years and is registered to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Offices and uh, for the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Dr. Smanda spent many years in research and development, most recently as a research fellow at the Dow Electronic Materials Company, where he worked on electronic application of nanotechnology and did research on photoresist materials. During his career, he designed <coughs> processes for making silicon devices at Bell Labs, did polymer research for micro and nanolithography, helped found a started company called Aspect Systems, and did fundamental research on electron transfer during molecular collision and practiced the wonderful art of X-ray crystallography. And in general, he had a lot of fun. He holds 31 US patents and is the author of over 60 scientific publications. Dr. Smanda holds a bachelor degree in chemistry from Loyola University and a PhD in chemical chemistry from the University of Wisconsin. Please welcome Dr. Smanda. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for uh, coming today, and uh, I want to thank the conference organizers. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, experience for me over the last uh, 24 years since I've been coming to this conference, and I must say that it's great uh, to be to be back. Um, this is going to be a little bit different uh, kind of a talk than the talks that you've seen because it's not really going to be technical in that sense, but it impacts, I think, tremendously on the uh, business environment, and so it's something that I think will, uh, will be of help to you. I hope it will anyway. In the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 says that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right uh, to their respective writings and discoveries. In those words, the entire patent system and trademark system and copyright system has been uh, derived. The exclusive right, I've underlined it because it's important. The exclusive right is a very, very clever way of granting intellectual property rights to people. Um, it is the right to exclude others from making, selling, or using an invention. It is the right to say no. Now, I want to stress that the exclusive right does not mean that you can practice your invention. What you can do with an exclusive right is to uh, it, uh, say no to others who want to practice your invention. For the last 223 years, that exclusive right was awarded to the first inventor, not the first person to file, at least not in the United States. That is different from the rest of the world, and it has caused some tension. So. Uh, over the last several years, a new law has gone into effect called the America Invents Act. Terrible title, but it, it has made tremendous changes, I think, in the law. Tremendous, maybe not in a good way. We'll have to see. And on March 16, 2013, all of that changes. The whole uh, system changes to a first-to-invent system. First-to-file system, sorry. Uh, I put this disclaimer up because we're told we have to, so there you go. All right. What is a U.S. patent? Well, as I said, it's an exclusive right. It's the right to exclude others from making, selling, using, or offering for sale or importing uh, an invention in, into the United States. And it protects any new and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition of matter, or any uh, uh, new and useful improvements thereof. Now, a patent application has to have a certain number of things. If you want to apply for a patent, you have to supply 
a written description that will teach someone of ordinary skill in the art, somebody who's not as smart as you, how to make and use your invention. The disclosure has to be, has also to, to uh, uh, give you the best mode of carrying out your invention. And finally, the invention or the patent application has to terminate with some claims. Uh, the claim is the thing. That is what, in fact, defines the meets and bounds of your rights under the patent system. Now, the claim invention must be novel, and it also must be non-obvious. And it is in those two terms that all of these changes will find their manifestation. So we're going to keep, we're going to go on with that then. Since what, what we're really talking about here is strategy and how the new patent law affects your strategy, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a view as to what I think strategy is. A strategy is nothing but a solution that takes you from where you are to where you want to go. Now, if you don't have a road map, if you're just kind of going on your own, you will get somewhere, but it may not be what you want. And that's the reason why you want to map out a strategy. So if you have a current situation and you want to go to, for example, interme intermediate situation number two, uh, the arrows show that you can get from uh, intermediate situation number two to the desired situation. However, you can also, there is a probability that you can go to a, solu a situation that you, don't, you want to avoid. So maybe you want to go instead to intermediate situation number three, and then on to the desired new situation. That's the kind of thing that you do when you strategize. I want to go from one point to another. And it's the ultimate purpose of the, 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 ultimate purpose of the strategy, or plan then, is to get to where you want to go using the right amount of effort. Here are two patents. Actually, they're two very interesting patents. And one of the things that you're told when you want to use somebody's work as an example is make sure they're dead. And uh, uh, these two people are, are, are definitely uh, dead. Um, one is Mr. Samuel Hopkins, who received the first patent ever issued in the United States on July 31st, 1790. Another one is to a Mr. Abraham Lincoln, who received a patent on uh, May 22nd, 1849. Now, both of those, these two gentlemen have uh, patented technologies. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln went on to become president of the United States and is the only president ever to have obtained a patent, for those of you who ever want to win a bar bet. Mr. Hopkins patented the first chemical product in the United States, or first patented chemical product in the United States. He invented a process for converting, pot, uh, for converting ashes, wood ashes, to potash and pearl ash. Now these two chemicals are, these two materials are uh, crude forms of potassium carbonate and are useful in, use, useful in making gunpowder and glass. They're useful in metallurgy, and were useful at that time in making bronzes, for example. And also, uh, they're useful for making a soft soap, a kind of material that is used to wash lanolin out of wool. And uh, that uh, actually uh, uh, had a tremendous demand at that time, but it had an even greater demand in, the, in uh, England because the woolen markets at that time were uh, uh, in high demand for this material, and there were no more trees left to burn in England, but there were, of course, in the United States. So these wood ashes were converted then to this material, turned into soft soap, and the soft soap made a, uh, was a tremendous export product from the early United States. Mr. Hopkins, though, was what we call a non-practicing entity. Some people would call him a patent troll. And let me tell you a little bit about what he did. He never practiced his invention. He actually went out and went from town to town, city to city, and actually hired agents to do the same. And 
licensed his patent, if you could pay the $50 fee, you could license his patent to make this potash and pearl ash, which was then used to make all these other products. Um, and uh, you had a ready supply of raw materials because people would bring uh, the, uh, uh, their wood ashes into a general store or wherever and uh, receive uh, uh, some, kind of, uh, uh, some kind of payment for them. So, so uh, this, was a, this was a nice little uh, business that he had for himself. And he uh, uh, used these agents that he had to make sure that uh, people complied with his patent rights and uh, went around and uh, uh, collected the fees. Mr. Hopkins had a strategy. Mr. Lincoln did not. Mr. Lincoln's invention was a method of buoying uh, ships over sandbars, what he called shoals, uh, when they had run aground, when they had run up on a sandbar. And he did so by deploying a series of bellows which would lower into the water, pushing the ship up, creating more buoyancy for the ship, and allowing the ship to float off the sandbar. He made a working model, whittled it himself, actually, and then took it to the patent office and received a patent for his invention. But he didn't have a plan, and his patent was never actually reduced to practice, and his invention never made a penny. That's the reason why you need a strategy. OK, let's take a look at the, some of the key changes that are in the law. First of all, we mentioned before priority, that is, who gets the patent goes to the first inventor to file instead of the first to invent. That takes place on March 16th of this year, about two and a half weeks from now. Now, we also have, along with this first to, uh, uh, in, uh, first to file system, uh, uh, some difference, uh, differences in how prior art is perceived. That also takes effect on the 16th of March. Um, the, the law also now provides three ways that third parties can challenge a patent within the United States Patent and Trademark Office without going to court. This is to address the question of patent quality. Um, and finally, the, uh, and also, there are two ways that a patent owner can make sure a patent is strong before suing somebody. Again, to address the, pre the, the question of patent quality. Uh, moreover, there is a prioritized examination system that uh, requires, higher, uh, uh, requires higher fees but with all the, uh, without all the search requirements that were in the previous law, and that moves your application to the head of the line. So if you have an application that you want to uh, push to the head of the line, you can do it. That's actually in effect right now. Some other changes, if you're a small company, a very small company, there is something called a micro-entity status that has created lower patent office fees for very, very small companies. Prior user rights, if you are sued for infringement, one uh, uh, defense against infringement is that you have been doing it. And uh, so prior user rights may apply. You may be able to defend yourself against infringement simply by showing that you, can, uh, that you have been practicing that invention. Uh, failure to present the best mode, they say failure to present the best mode is no longer a ground for ruling a patent invalid, uh, even though it is still required by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, there are good reasons to do it anyway. Uh, I once formed, in, informed a client that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the negative effects of not including the best mode in the patent application have gone away. However, if I were to submit a patent application for that client uh, that did, uh, knowingly did not include the best mode, I might lose my license. My client told me that that was a risk he was willing to take. Uh, there, you, there are good reasons why you want to include the best mode, and you should do it, and uh, uh, not the least of which is that it's still required under the law. And finally, uh, in accordance with the rest of the world, assignees may file without inventors. So that's uh, another one of those little uh, things that uh, can 
can be of use uh, uh, in, in the patent system. Now, I'm not going to ask you to read this. This is statutory language, and I'm going to triple distill it, or at least double distill it, before uh, we, try to, we try to leave this alone. But I want to call your attention to the underlined words in the, uh, in the language, the effective filing date of the claimed invention, because that is now going to be the date that uh, uh, receives priority in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The effective filing date can be anything. It can be an, at the earliest possible patented uh, uh, date at which a patent was applied, for example. It might be a U.S. provisional application. It might be a British provisional application or a Japanese kokai. It might be a German ordinary patent application or it might be a U.S. non-provisional application. The earliest date that applies is the earliest date to which you are claiming priority and that is the uh, earliest effective filing date. What does that set up? Well, it sets up a race. It sets up a race to the patent office. So for applications filed on or, on or after March 16, 2013, the priority goes to the first one to get there, even if that inventor was not the first to invent. The date of invention no longer matters except for applications filed before the 16th. Now, that's not exactly right because there are some other reasons why you want to keep the date of invention in mind, but it's close. So, prior art under the new law. Let's start distilling that statutory language down into something a little bit more palatable. The claimed invention is not considered to be novel if it is patented or described in a printed publication or it is in public use, on sale, or otherwise available to the public. Now, that last catch-all phrase is something that is somewhat disturbing. Before the effective filing date of the claimed invention, the statute goes on to say that the claimed invention is novel if it is described but not necessarily claimed in a U.S. patent or application or international application by another inventor and filed, uh, not published, but filed before the effective filing date of the claimed invention. Now that is interesting because suppose an inventor files, an inv files a patent application, it has not yet published, and the, and the patent examiner uses that application against you and you don't know what it is. You can't see it, but it has, because it hasn't been published yet. That's called secret prior art. And it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a problem and it's going to have to be addressed legislatively. Um, now, there is a grace period involved. In the United States, unlike in foreign countries, the United States grants one year grace period. And let's look at that. That's uh, well, first of all, let's distill it down one more time. This is, the easy, this is the easy version. If your claimed invention is out there and you didn't put it out there, your invention is not novel. If you did, not, if you did put the invention out there, um, you have a year from the date of, uh, of the information release to file your application in the United States. Now, if the same owner discloses it in a patent application, you know how sometimes that happens. You have uh, several patent applications that you're filing and they all contain essentially the same disclosure and you might be filing them over a year's time or maybe two years time. Those will not be prior out against you because they are the same owner or the same inventor. Uh, so that is one exception. But it is important now to know that information release of an invention can cause significant, have significant effects on your right to practice. I'm not saying that publication is bad. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say that publication is more important now than ever. But it must be done in a disciplined manner. Um, and and, and that, that, I think, is, is one of the reasons why uh, we need to talk about how this is going on. Now, the exceptions to this um, have to do with the grace period for filing. If you're an inventor or an owner, you have a one-year grace period. 
a company's own applications, again, this is according to 102B, section 102B, a company's own applications are uh, not prior art against, uh, uh, against the patent uh, in question. And this appears, and we don't know for sure, but it appears to uh, uh, include companies that are operating under JDAs because they use language that sort of supports that notion. Um, okay, this gets us to the question of obviousness. Now, I think you probably all have had some time or other had the exa a patent examiner come back to you and say that an invention, uh, the invention was obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art. So let's just go over how, an, uh, how a patent examiner actually does that, how a patent examiner actually establishes a case for obviousness. Generally speaking, when the examiner looks at your claim, she tries to pull from one source and another source and maybe even another source all of the elements of your claim and assemble your claimed invention from the prior art. It is not the same thing as, as anticipation. It is not the, that's not what it is. What the examiner is doing is saying, okay, I can take this piece over here and I can bring it in. I can take a piece over here and bring it in, and so on, and, and then assemble the invention, the claimed invention, uh, from the prior art, from several references. Now, if all of the elements of the claim that have been assembled from prior references basically have the same function that they always have, then according to the Supreme Court, that invention is likely to be obvious. There are other obvious cases, obviousness cases, but a prima facie case of obviousness is generally put together in something like that way. Now the law on obvious is essentially unchanged except for this nasty little thing, not nasty really, but this thing about uh, uh, the uh, keying off the effective filing date and not the invention date. So it used to be that you could swear behind some kind of uh, uh, reference against you. Today, that's no longer the case. And in fact, obviousness can also include this uh, rather Orwellian thing called secret prior art, which I think is uh, uh, something that's going to be a problem, but I hope it isn't. Now, our friend over here uh, on the left-hand side uh, uh, has a cat and a laser pointer and uh, uh, this, gen this gentleman was issued patent number 543036, I guess it is. Um, the method of exercising a cat, and I leave to you, given what you now know about obviousness, as an exercise, to go out and in 15 minutes see if you can find the prior art that would, uh, that would make a prima facie case of obviousness for a method of exercising a cat using a laser pointer. Uh, that would be uh, an exercise that you should do. Okay, here's an exercise we're going to do here. A is uh, uh, one inventor, B is another inventor, and we have a timeline. So A invents, okay, and, and, uh, and uh, doesn't file for a while. We'll just kind of leave that, bl uh, leave that blank for a moment. And B invents... Um, independently. Now B, being a good SPIE member, decides to write a paper for SPIE and publishes it describing the entire invention. Now in the United States, B has a year. Okay? So the question becomes, and, he, and B then goes ahead and files for a patent application, files a patent application after publishing. Now the question becomes, does A get a patent. Can anybody tell me? Okay, somebody said no. That's right. Publication bars A from getting a patent because B disclosed it before A filed. All right. Does B get a patent? Well, actually, no, probably not, because A, unless A doesn't disclose properly or something like that, 
A has applied for a patent and has created what is very probably secret prior art against B. And so eventually B will not get a patent. However, B has defended himself against A's patent application because uh, B will not be barred by A from practicing the invention. Now there may be another bar out there someplace, but A is not going to bar B from practicing the invention. So we can see here that a publication is a defensive tool, even though B doesn't get the patent. Let's make this slightly different. Let's say that A invents, B in, in due course invents independently and publishes a SPIE paper and uh, uh, then A and B file on the same day. It's less than one year after publication. The question is, does A get a patent? The answer is no. A is barred because B disclosed before A filed. Same answer as before. Uh, the invention date doesn't matter at all for getting a patent. Well, the question then becomes, does B get a patent? Well, yeah, maybe B may get a patent because, assuming no other prior art, uh, uh, B has filed within the one-year time frame. And since A can't get a patent, B can, maybe, unless, you know, unless there's some other prior art or some other reason why. All else being equal, B can get a patent. So here it is. A publication can be a sword and a shield. A publication can prevent B from being, uh, from, from using, uh, or, or a publication can prevent A from uh, asserting a patent against B, but it can also allow B to get a patent that he might not otherwise have gotten. Now, one of the things that this, the patent system has uh, done is to uh, uh, harmonize, at least to some extent, with the rest of the world. But harmony is not entirely uh, uh, forthcoming. And so I want to show you just a little bit about what goes on with some of these other, uh, uh, with, with what happens. Now, we are looking at a U.S. timeline and, a, and a, a, an imaginary country with a, an absolute novelty requirement. The invention occurs. Nothing happens, but the invention occurs. The uh, somebody makes a confidential disclosure under a non-disclosure agreement. No problem. Nothing happens. Somebody makes a confidential offer for sale. Well, the thinking now is that the statute actually gives that confidential offer for sale the one-year grace period. And uh, in, in foreign countries, it doesn't matter at all. Now, if the patentee publishes, uh, that basically stops any possibility of foreign coverage for, uh, for someone else. If, uh, uh, on the other hand, since it's still within that one-year deadline, the US, uh, in the U.S., the uh, inventor can still get a patent up until the point where somebody else, a publication not by the patentee, occur, uh, appears. At that point, the whole thing stops, and it's too late. So there is a slight difference now between the United States and the rest of the world, but it's coming closer together. I'll just skip that. Now, first to file does not mean the indention date is entirely irrelevant. There are no more interference proceedings. These were terrible things that uh, went on for a fairly long time. Uh, they cost upwards of a million dollars to uh, to fight, and were uh, and were uh, uh, something that I think lawyers made a lot of money on. But I think clients came out of uh, out of the other end usually not feeling very good. Uh, anyway, there's no more interference proceeding, but there is something called a derivation proceeding. I think it'll be a simpler proceeding, and it basically asks the question: Did the applicant derive the claimed invention from another applicant? In, in other words, did the applicant steal the invention? So what I would argue here is that notebooks are still important. If anybody thinks that this new patent law will mean that they don't have to keep notebooks, I would say go in the opposite direction. 
and start to devolve notebook note taking and notebooks into even the manufacturing area to create a paper trail so that you can establish that the invention was made and, uh, and uh, 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 practiced. Moreover, lab notebooks may be important for another reason. That's this whole idea of prior user rights. Let's say that you have a trade secret and you're not going to patent it and somebody comes along and patents what you have been doing. Under the old law, you have to stop under the new, unless you license it. Under the new law, you can use as a defense to infringement this prior user right. But again, keeping a notebook is absolutely critical. The evidentiary standard here is clear and convincing evidence, which is uh, actually right below the uh, uh, beyond reasonable doubt evidential, uh, evidentiary standard, and it's extremely uh, rigorous. So if you have notes, if you have documentation throughout the organization that you've been practicing this invention all along, it's much easier to, uh, to defend, defend yourself against an infringement claim. So the question is, I, I, I like design experiments, and I think a lot of you probably do too. What would a response surface do? And I don't have the answer to that. What, but if you had a response surface that was well characterized, would that allow you the full scope of the response surface in a prior user defense? Interesting thought. OK. Now let's talk a little bit about how patent quality can be assured. Let's suppose that you are about ready to sue somebody but you really don't know whether your patent is is going to stand up the question is what can you do to find out well the US patent office has now got two proceedings one of them is a little bit simpler one of them is a little bit more complicated one is designed to address the question of novelty and obviousness while the other is designed to dis to address all questions um, they're expensive. The ex parte reexamination, it's, an old, it's a, an old part of the law, but it's still valid, is about $17,750. And that's, that's just for openers. If you have more claims than that, it's going to cost you more. But it only addresses novelty and non-obviousness. It goes to a senior patent examiner, and uh, it's patents and printed publications. So those are the, those are the evidence that you, that you submit. The supplemental examination is a different thing. Uh, you have a, a substantial new question ability, but it's any information that can go to the patent examiner. And it can, for example, if you have an inadequate or you, you think you may have an inadequate uh, 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 disclosure, or if you have, for example, uh, an inventor who has committed uh, uh, inequitable conduct before the patent office, these this proceeding can actually cure that for you. Uh, it costs a fair amount of money, but it's better than taking it to court where it's going to cost you over a million dollars to get started. Moreover, you have third party challenges. And here we have a, an 1895 patent, Swiss patent, for a motorcycle uh, that was recently uh, 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 asserted or recently put forth as prior art to a motorcycle patent. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, recently obtained. Um, one of them is uh, really cool. It's called a pre-grant submission. It allows anybody to submit uh, a, a reference to the patent examiner. And for example, if you have a competitor out there, you see a published application, that competitor might be, uh, uh, might be surprised to learn that uh, this new reference is uh, in the hands of the examiner. Uh, and anybody can submit them. So you probably ought to be keeping your eyes on the, uh, on the thing. The other two are post-grant review and inter-party reviews. They're extremely expensive. One is about $35,000. The other one is around $27,200. Uh, if you ever find yourself in that situation, you better arm yourself with some good legal advice. Okay, I want to say one, uh, just a little bit more, stress a little bit more about pre-grant submissions. Any document that relates to the issue of patentability can be submitted. 
Concise statements of why the uh, uh, document is relevant are required. Uh, it must be submitted before the notice of allowance and up to six months after publication or before the first office action, whichever is later, and it has to be signed and so forth. But the person submitting it doesn't have to tell you who the real, tell the patent office who the real party in interest is. So it can be sent in elect, uh, uh, anonymously. Okay, patent strategy. The steps in formulating a patent strategy are going to be something like this. They're going to, you're going to clarify your objectives. You're going to assess your current situation, set targets, measure progress toward goals, and finally choose the strategy that you want to pursue. Okay, I'm going to be looking at the, um, uh, the second two items because that's really what the new law affects here. So let's talk about publication strategies. We uh, touched on it before, but let's talk about them again. Publications are partly defensive and partly offensive, but the timing is very important. Now, your patent attorney and agent can help you with that, but you really need to have that uh, uh, really need to have that help. Uh, and publication can be anywhere. There's, there are ways you could publish for that nobody will ever find the information. Um, you may wish to consider publishing articles offensively about what your competitor might be doing, and, but don't say it's bad. That's not the right thing to do because that's called teaching away. You don't want to be doing that. But that may be something that you want to actually consider. And when you do publish, and I think this is going to be welcome news to people here at SPIE, when you do publish, when you publish at the right time, it is actually in your interest to publish a complete description of the invention. Don't get cagey. Once you've got your patent application applied for, you may find that it's in your interest to publish the invention and get it out there. Um, and also consider how publication strategies can mix with your patent strategies and how you do these things. Generally speaking, uh, publishing and patenting on the same day isn't such a bad idea. Now, putting, the, putting together a patent strategy with the first to file system, uh, there are multiple, there, there is an advantage to putting together multiple provisional applications. A provisional application is cheap and easy to submit. Uh, you can, uh, you can actually uh, send in several provisionals during the course uh, of the invention, and then when you file the non-provisional application, claim the benefit of them all. Um, I would say search, search, search. Don't, don't try to do this thing, uh, fly blind on this. Uh, some people would disagree, but I think that's bad advice. Finally, uh, file provisional applications. If you are practicing a trade secret, a provisional application is never examined, and unless you actually uh, file a non-provisional application claiming its benefit, that provisional application will never see the light of day. So what I would do is, if you're practicing a trade secret, file a provisional application on it, um, and keep renewing it year after year if you have to, but file that provisional over and over again, and that way if somebody else tries to patent your trade secret, you have earlier priority and you may be able to defeat that uh, patent going forward. Don't stop keeping notebooks. I think we went over that, so I won't uh, belabor the point. And it may be that scientists and engineers will be participating uh, more in the process because of all of this stuff that has to get done. What I would say there is train them. Uh, train them, for example, not to use what we call patent profanity. Now, profane words in the patent business are a little bit like, uh, like George Carlin, you know, things you can't say on TV. But in the patent business, somebody says, the invention is, that's a profane phrase. In the patent business, if somebody says preferred, that's a profane phrase. Or absolutely, or necessary, or uh, crucial, or all of the rest. As soon as a court sees a word like that, they will narrow the scope of your claims, almost guaranteed. And make sure, uh, make use of third party submissions. Try and find those things and get them, uh, get them into the patent office so that somebody else might 
so that uh, your competitors can deal with uh, uh, can deal with the uh, 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 the references that you found. Now, after a patent issues, the cost of any proceeding increases dramatically. So the bottom line here is make sure that you can do everything you can do before the patent issues. And uh, consider initiating one-party proceedings, ex parte proceedings, such as re-exam, when the time comes if you have to sue somebody, and inter-party proceedings may be initiated by uh, any hostile party, and uh, uh, you, know, you just have to be ready for them. So, the patent laws in the United States have gone, undergone massive changes. These new changes are meant to better the quality of patents, and if you use them, I think they very well could. So uh, they present some challenges, yes, but they also prevent some, uh, present some uh, competitive opportunities for those who adjust their strategies to align with the new law. And I thank you. So I assume it will be very hard for the people to ask you questions. <laughs> this on? Hi. Hi. Very nice talk. I have a, I mean, you know, talks from lawyers, technologists, you did a great job. Um, I have a question. So suppose some, this has to do with what prior art means, and, and I'm going to pick on graphene since many people know about graphene. Okay. So sometime long before Nozloff and Geim decided that scotch tape could take a single layer of graphene off of graphite, Theoretical predictions about the, the properties of graphene seem to be, have been published by theoreticians in the physics literature many years beforehand. So would that be considered prior art and negate the possibility of patenting graphene had they tried to patent that process for graphene? You ask an excellent question. Um, uh, the answer is probably not but I, I can't absolute, be absolutely certain. Graphene wasn't made until somebody took graphite and a piece of scotch tape and ripped it apart, right? So uh, in, that case, uh, uh, in that case, nobody enabled anything. Uh, the theoreticians got up and said, you know, if we could make a single layer of carbon that was just a bunch of aromatic rings, we might be able to get all kinds of nifty properties out of it. But that was the same thing as, uh, for example, at the University of Rochester, when they said, if we can, uh, if we can prevent the, uh, uh, prevent or inhibit uh, cyclooxygenase 2, we might be able to relieve pain without upsetting people's stomachs. And that lost in court. They got a patent on it all right. But when it went to court, it became very clear that they really didn't enable the invention and didn't have a written description of how to carry it out. So until you've got a written description there, you haven't got a patent. You haven't got a patentable invention. I have a question. Who sees re-examination? Is it uh, is it public? Um, uh, re-examination is conducted. These these uh, uh, re-examination proceedings are conducted pretty much in public. Um, uh, they're conducted, generally speaking, before senior patent examiners. Uh, but the, and they're usually conduct well. They're always conducted by, in writing, but you can follow the uh, proceedings basically uh, uh, by well, looking at the patent uh, uh, file wrapper. I can actually show you how to do that if you want. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question yes. on the, the notebooks. Uh, you were putting a lot of emphasis on the importance of. Uh, keep using notebooks, Yes. Uh, but what about, uh, let's say, in the digital era, maybe people do not use notebooks anymore, so they send emails to a colleague with an ID, uh, maybe they scribble on a tablet and use that for their archives. Is that valid from a legal point of view? Um, I, I would say any kind of documentation that you can use, including email, uh, would, would be helpful. Uh, uh, and of course, there are electronic notebooks as well that are useful, uh, that are used, as, especially in places like the pharmaceutical industry. So, 
Yeah, there's more than one way to, to do it. And you, can, uh, you, might, you might not want to keep a physical notebook, but you might want to have some kind of electronic record. That's fine as long as the date can be verified. OK, thank you. Hi, Chuck. Uh, Hi, Chris. Can you, uh, of all the aspects of the new patent law that you described today, are any of them retroactive to patents filed before March 16, 2013? Um, uh, things like uh, re-examination, I think, are, are going to be retroactive. Um, until March 16th, uh, some of these uh, inter-party um, processes are not going to be active. Um, right now, you can actually submit prior art to the patent office as a third party submitter. And so any, any patent that's been filed, you can, you can actually go ahead and do that right now. Uh, but for example, the, the new definition of what is prior art. Yes. Does that only apply to patents filed after oh, March 16th? Yes, let me answer your question directly. Absolutely yes. Uh, what is, that question is answered uh, by saying that it's only in those applications that are filed on or after the 16th of March of this year. Everything else is fine. So if you have something you want to file under the old system and you can get it in before the 16th of March, you're good. Okay. Please thank the speaker again.